talking about standing in faith, what does that mean? Anybody want to share what it, what does it mean to stand in our faith? Well, when you're waiting for an answer um, for for God to intercede in, in a matter, it's just that you continue to believe the whole time you're waiting. Absolutely. Stand strong, stand firm in what you're believing and hoping for, and uh, yeah, don't don't let it pass you by. So on the heels of that, standing in faith, why is it important that we stand in faith? Because sometimes it's hard. Why not just, you know, just sit down and just give up? Well, why is it important, therefore, to stand in faith? Any takers on that? Well, God works through our faith. He works through faith, not unbelief. Mm -hmm. And so if we are unbelieving, we tie his hands, and then he can't do what he would like to do because he'd be honoring the wrong kind of mindset. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. And you never know just what is going to happen uh, through your stand of faith. And, and we see all throughout the Bible, when people stood in faith, it opened the door for God to do amazing things. And we're going to continue to look at that. We've been looking at uh, some, some Bible heroes, just some classic stories of those who stood in faith. We looked at, at Daniel, for example, uh, who was very bright, elevated to very high positions uh, in uh, a captive land that wasn't his own. Uh, and so the edict was written against him to stop praying. He didn't. He continued to pray, continued to do what he always did, and he was thrust into the lion's den. Well, because his lifestyle was just a life of constantly standing in faith, God stood for him. Uh, he survived the lion's den, and then God used that to bring a revival all across the land. Uh, last week, we looked at Esther, at her story, how that she stood bravely before the king and was able to intercede uh, on behalf of her people. And we kind of looked at uh, the, the main part of her story. Today we're going to pick up on that and continue. Uh, our focus is in the book of Esther, uh, but we're going to continue in, in, in her story, focusing on, uh, on Mordecai, or Mordecai, however you like to pronounce it, uh, and see that his stand for faith caused him to be elevated uh, and how, how God will richly bless us when we take a stand in faith and we'll will elevate us to places of influence uh, where we can impact people for God. And, and that's ultimately what it's all about. So um, we'll, we'll kick it off here with uh, an interesting little story that sometimes standing in faith can be kind of like this. Not long ago, there, there was a husband and a wife uh, who lived and worked in a, in a large city. They did not own a car, and they used public transportation for for all of their commuting back and forth. Uh, it was very prolific there, uh, so they had plenty of ways to get around. Well, they lived in a small apartment, as many city dwellers do, and they had a very large dog. And unfortunately, their dog passed away, and they quickly needed a solution for disposing the body. They didn't have five acres that could go out to the back and just take care of the body. Um, so the wife called the vet, who kindly agreed uh, to take the dog's remains and dispose of them decently and properly. So she had to find a way to get the dog's remains to the vet's office because they didn't have a car. So she had to do this through public transportation. She found an old piece of luggage and she stuffed the dog's body into the luggage. She made her way downstairs to the train station and after she boarded, she tried to lift the luggage up into the luggage compartment and she struggled, it was heavy, and a kind stranger came and offered to help, to give her some assistance. And when it was obvious that she could not do it on her own, he put it in there for her. Um, and in passing, he, he mentioned, man, this bag is really heavy. And he kind of inquired about its contents. Well, she was in a pickle and quite embarrassed and didn't know exactly how to explain the situation. So she was dishonest and she said, the bag was full of computer components. So at her stop, she pulled the bag down, she disembarked from the train, and in that moment, the stranger grabbed her luggage and ran away down the street. Oh no. <laughs> Problem solved. Oh no. <laughs> oh man. So sometimes life can be that way. 
You know, um, not every solution to every problem is simple, um, but often, even when things are complex, um, God has a way of, of working it out mm -hmm. for the good. And um, certainly this notion uh, is true for those who live for God. Um, never know just how God's gonna, gonna take your situation and, and work it out one way or another. And, and that's the assurance that we have when we stand in faith. If we don't stand for God, we don't have any assurance that in our time of need or in our difficult situations, he's going to stand for us. But when we do stand for him in faith, we can have that blessed assurance that yeah. God's going to stand for me uh, in the moment and in the time when I need him. Uh, a friend was explaining yesterday uh, in my hearing that uh, oftentimes God doesn't take us on a very straight path, but it's up and down and this way and that way. Um, and, and when we have a close relationship with God, no matter what way our path goes, how expected or unexpected, he will lead us through that path. Not always making it straight and easy, but knowing he's going to be there and he's going to help us. And certainly we see that was true for Daniel, that was true for Esther, uh, and we're going to see today as we get into the lesson how that was true uh, for Mordecai as well. You'll notice on your table you've got some different items um, that you could use for drafting and sending a letter. It's kind of an old-fashioned thing anymore. Uh, I don't know who still sends letters. Um, I try to every once in a while. Uh, we need to do that a whole lot more often um, because it's just special to get mail that's not a bill <laughs> or a political campaign card. Um, and so today we're gonna look at some significant letters that were drafted in the Bible uh, and, and how they played an important part uh, in these stories and, and, in, and in God's, God's will being done. So, so on that focus, I'll just throw in a little plug. Write a letter to somebody. Send somebody something old-fashioned snail mail, uh, and I'm sure it would be a blessing to them. Uh, we received a, a card from Bryson's Sunday school teacher uh, since he was gone the other week, and man, that just meant so much, you know? Anybody can send a text or an email, but the extra time it takes to send a letter uh, just is, is special. That's free. That's, that's not in the lesson. <laughs> but it's a, it's a good thing for us to, to not forget and enjoy. But anyway, there's a, uh, there's a really popular letter. I don't know if popular is the right word, but kind of is. Uh, it's one of the most controversial letters uh, written in American history. It's known as the Bixby letter, B-I-X-B-Y, Bixby. Anyone ever heard of that letter before? Yeah, um, most of us haven't, but way back in November of 1864, uh, the governor of Massachusetts, he wrote to then President Abraham Lincoln, and he asked him to compose uh, a condolence letter to a lady named Lydia Bixby. It was reported that all five of her sons had been killed in battle in the Civil War, um, and the president, therefore, uh, honored her request, and he, he wrote a letter. It's 139 words. Um, he expressed his sorrow, um, and that they were praying, quote, that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and the lost, end quote. So this letter is argued by scholars and historians, uh, whether Lincoln wrote it by his own hand or whether his very talented secretary John Hay wrote it. We don't know. But either way, um, this letter is one of the most uh, important and, and famous letters from the Civil War era. Uh, but before that letter was ever written, uh, there was a letter written by Mordecai here in the Bible uh, that was one of the most famous letters written during war. Um, his letter followed the awful decree that Haman had sent in the king's name to annihilate all the Jews in Persia. Um, the king could not reverse the decree to destroy the Jews, but instead, Mordecai's letter, which was written in the king's name, that we're gonna look at, gave the Jews the royal right to defend themselves against their enemy. So this letter that he wrote, just a commonplace letter, it saved a people. It gave them the legal liberty to defend themselves, and because of it, we have a Jewish nation here today. When the Jews received and read this letter from Mordecai, they were filled with joy. Their death sentence was lifted. It was eradicated. Um, their enemies still attacked. Uh, if you've read that Bible account, you know there was still attacking and, and some warfare on that day. 
Um, but the Jews marshaled their own army. They were able to defend themselves, and ultimately um, their nation was preserved, all basically from a letter. So letters have significance, uh, and we're going to see how that it does here today in, in this story. So let's look. We've got uh, our Bible text is in Esther chapter 9, and we'll skip around just a little bit, but we've got verses 1 through 5. And then verses 13 through 17, just giving you here the, uh, the Bible account of this focus on, on the letters. Um, and, and what our lesson is all about today is, is this. God will elevate people to places of influence if they stand for righteousness. If you take a stand for what you know is right in God's eyes, in his time, he will elevate you to a position where you can influence others. Certainly that was true for Daniel, that was true for Esther. We're going to see today how it was true for Mordecai and for all of God's people. So uh, beginning with Esther chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, the word says, Now in the twelfth month, that is the month Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put into execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. It's just how God works. The Jews gathered themselves together, verse 2, in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as thought their hurt, and no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. And all the rulers of the provinces, and the lieutenants, and the deputies, and the officers of the king helped the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. He elevated greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction, and did what they would do, did what they would unto those that hated them. God turned it around for their good. Then the next section, 13 through 17, would someone want to read that one for us? Go ahead. Then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews, which are in Shushan, to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree. And let Haman, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it so, so to be done. And the decree was given to Shushan. And they hanged Haman's ten sons. You said through 15? Through 17. 17, okay. Mm -hmm. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also of the month of Adar and slew 300 men at Shushan. But on the prey they laid not their hand. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes seventy and five thousand, but they laid not their hands on the prey. On the thirteenth day of the month Adar, Adar, and on the fourteenth day of the same rested day, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. All right, thank you. So God came through as he always does. So that's what took place. Now let's, uh, let's kind of examine it here for how it might benefit us. We're going to look at, at three categories or topics, if you will. First of all, uh, we're going to look at Esther's last request because she did approach the king again to where he raised out the scepter and accepted. Uh, and so we're going to look at what her, her final request was. Then secondly, we'll look at Mordecai's letter and, and examine it a little bit. And then thirdly, we'll see about Mordecai's promotion and how God God used it so greatly. So, um, you know, by the, by the Lord's help, Esther was able to achieve victory over Haman. In Esther chapter 7, Haman's plot against God's people was revealed. It was brought into light. Uh, and Haman was hanged on the very gallows that he had constructed uh, for Mordecai uh, and the Jews. This important victory, it brought reprieve to Esther and Mordecai. Um, but you understand that the, the edict of the king was still in effect. He wrote that his armies would go and, and defeat the Jews. And remember, we talked about previously that when the king of Persia wrote something into, into order, it could not be reversed. 
could not be vetoed. It could not be retracted. It was law. So God brought victory here, but this edict was still in place. And so the Jews faced um, an upcoming battle uh, that, that was still going to happen. Um, the war was not yet won. So therefore, Esther, knowing her job was not yet complete, she sought the king's favor again. And in Esther 8, 3 through 6, it lets us know that she fell at the feet of the king and she petitioned him on behalf of her people. Uh, verse 3 tells us that Esther spoke again to the king, and again the king held out the golden scepter to her, accepting her, allowing her to come and to speak. Um, and, and Esther was again able to intercede for her people. She risked her life a second, uh, an additional time. Um, and, and she demonstrated God's love for his people because she brought their need before the king. She risked her life on behalf of her people. She loved her people that much that she was willing to bring their need before the king uh, in a way that she may have had nothing to gain personally. Uh, and that's a great example for us to see um, of faith, overcoming fear, uh, having faith in God, faith in the king instead of doubt. Sometimes it can feel challenging for us to petition God um, on, on behalf of, of another person where there doesn't necessarily seem to be a direct benefit to us personally. But Galatians 6 2 uh, commands us to bear one another's burdens. That's part of what we do as the people of God, as the body of Christ, is we bring these burdens, these needs before God on behalf of other people uh, and in so doing, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. That's what he did for us. We're identifying and fulfilling his ways when we do that. By caring for one another, when it may not directly benefit ourselves personally, we demonstrate the love of Christ. Greater loveth no man. And he would give his life for his friends, giving yourself without anything uh, to gain. In doing so, uh, that honors God and that glorifies his church. So we, we, can, we can see that through, uh, through Esther's petition of the king. So in Esther 8 and 5, she petitioned the king that he would reverse the decree uh, of Haman. And she wanted the king to intervene uh, and, and reverse this decree, which you remember the decree was for the um, unrestrained slaughter of the Jews. Uh, it's important to remember, uh, and it was interesting, I never saw this before until studying at this time. It was, it was Mordecai's bold stand that initiated this whole entire thing. Um, and so it's important to remember that Haman's act of evil came as a result of his encounter with Mordecai. We, we understand that, that Haman's family line from way back when uh, were enemies of the Jews from way back when. So there was that... Uh, that cultural animosity toward one another that really came to light in Haman and Mordecai's struggle here. Um, and so there were these negative interactions, um, but the story tells us that in response to Mordecai not bowing, Haman created this plot to destroy not only Mordecai, but all of God's people. Um, and so this also reminds us that we have an enemy of our soul, that goes way back, uh, that's always looking for a chance and a strategy and an opportunity to try to get the best of us and the church. Right. Um, we can't be ignorant of that, that the feud goes back way, way, way back when, when the prophecy was given that the heel would bruise the head, but the head would bite the heel. Uh, we're living that out, and we have, to, we have to be reminded of that, that we do have an enemy that's trying to take advantage of us, so we've got to stand in our faith and always be on guard and be be ready for whatever uh, the day holds so again to try to uh, reverse these evils of Haman and to stand against them uh, Esther sought a reversal of the plan and it's interesting because you would think Esther would know that this law could not be revoked she certainly was not ignorant to how this process worked um, and so in his response to Esther, uh, King Xerxes declared that a law written in the name of the king and sealed with his ring cannot be revoked. 
Esther 8 and chapter 8. Um, another proclamation by the king was recorded in the book of Daniel, chapter 6 and verse 8, about the same thing. Um, so why would Esther ask for this to be revoked when she surely knew that it couldn't? It was, it was not possible. So that's a good question for us to think about. Why would she petition the king that way when she knew he could not and, and would not reverse the law? Well, um, one possibility, and, and this kind of kind of stirs our faith a little bit, one possibility is that by asking the king to revoke the law, something that could not be achieved, Esther was trying to set the bar at the highest level it could possibly be set. She wasn't willing to come before the king and ask for something little, something doable, but she's like, I'm going to go all the way up. I'm going to ask the king to do the impossible. I'm just going to I'm just going to put it out there at the highest possible opportunity. Um, she was requesting that the king do something he was not able to do, and this likely would ensure that he would do everything that was permitted within the law. If she asked for the highest, maybe he couldn't do the highest, but maybe he would do his very best in as much as he could because of what she asked for. Does that make sense? She had faith hey, I'm going to ask for the greatest thing that could possibly happen. And then who knows what would come out of it. Um, perhaps Esther was asking the king to do what was impossible so that he would do everything within his power to meet this request as much as he could. Um, even though the law did not permit it, she approached the king as though he could alter the law if he so chose. Now, this is a, an important lesson for us. Uh, and I think you get where we're going. Um, how many times are we uh, guilty of coming before God and asking far less than what he is capable of doing? When, when I was studying this, it was like, oh, <laughs> it hit me in the heart. Like, Lord, yeah, there's times I come before you in prayer and, and my request is so little compared to what you could do in this situation. It really stirred me and ministered to me that, you know, we ought to be like Esther. God, I know that this is an impossible thing, but I'm going to ask you for it anyway, because I know you're God. You're the king. You, of all people, can make it happen. Um, so so this, is, this is good for us to look at her boldness, her faith, uh, and to reflect on our own prayers. Uh, do our own prayers um, honor God as the maker of heaven and earth? Do our own prayers show him that we believe he's the king? And he could do anything. Do our own prayers set the bar as high as it could possibly go. And then give God the liberty to answer it however, however that he would. It's good food for thought. And may it encourage your heart in the way you pray as it did for me. Man, Esther, she knew how to stand in faith. And, and may we have that, that same spirit working among us. So, so this is Esther's request. And... and the king, of course, was unable to reverse the decree. But what he did and what he opened the door to happen uh, was, was nevertheless maybe just as powerful as if he would have reversed it. So he gave Mordecai the power and the authority to write another decree. Okay, Can't change this law, but let's write a law that deals with it and come right on the heels of it. Um, Esther 8 and chapter 8 tells us that King Xerxes toward Mordecai, told Mordecai he could write a decree as he pleased. He could write it in the king's name, and he could have it sealed with the king's signet ring. In other words, it was as though Mordecai was given a blank check. Yes. Here you go. Do what you need to do with it. However it needs to be taken care of, here you go. Wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. Um, Mordecai then had the freedom to craft this decree to build it up in such a way that would most benefit the Jews. And that was pretty cool how God worked that out. So, so let's look at here some of the specific elements that the king listed uh, for, for this decree. So first of all, Mordecai could write it as he pleased. Uh, Mordecai could use his knowledge, his firsthand knowledge, what it was like to be a Jew, what they felt, what they went through, what they were subject to um, as a subjugated people. Um, so he knew how to to write it in such a way that it would have the most impact. The king wouldn't understand every area from where Mordecai was coming, so Mordecai was able to, to draft it 
uh, with, with such knowledge and such ability that it would have the most impact. Um, so he could design this, this letter and this decree uh, to empower the Jews and to uh, protect them from further repercussions. That's pretty cool. Um, so next, the king said that it would be written in his name as though the king himself had written it. You know, that's how it works in politics. You know, you get a letter in the mail from the president. Well, he didn't really write it. His staff did. Uh, but it aligns with his, um, his, his leadership, his policy, you know. Uh, so this letter would be written in the king's name as though the king himself had written it. Um, and that meant, of course, that the decree, as seen by the public eye, would appear as though it came from the king. Um, people in far off provinces um, wouldn't even consider not following it because it was written in the king's name, right? That name carries such power uh, and such authority. This letter would carry the weight of the king's word and it would carry the authority and impact wherever it was read. You remember, this kingdom was a vast kingdom. It stretched far, far and wide. So this was not a light deal. Uh, in the ancient world, it would be seen and experienced as though the king himself had journeyed to that province and delivered the word in person. It came in the king's name. Lastly, the, uh, the letter would be sealed with the king's signet ring. Uh, this seal would affirm its authenticity as a document coming from the monarch himself. So uh, we don't seal letters with wax and a little emblem anymore, uh, but there are certain official seals, like this shiny gold seal here. This is my um, ministry license, and so it's got a seal on it to, to look official, uh, to show, you know, this wasn't just a template on the internet that we printed off and said, oh, he's a minister now, but it's got an official seal, and that seal carries weight. It's authentic. It's a it, it comes from the, the right source. And, and so that's what having this letter sealed with the king's ring uh, would communicate and would bring about. That this is authentic, this is from the king himself, and you better listen to what it has to say. So um, because of what the king said, the decree or the letter, uh, its effectiveness, its authority, and its authenticity were all above, above reproach. In other words, this decree would make a difference. It would do something. It was legit. It was a real deal. Um, so Esther and Mordecai, they, they stood against the wicked decree of Haman, um, just like the three Hebrew young men in the book of Daniel stood against an evil king when it could have meant their death. In the New Testament, apostles frequently stood against uh, evil influences uh, and enemies that tried to prohibit the progress of the church and and we as present-day disciples we must continue to do the same we must stand against the decrees of the enemy and there's a lot of them coming out here some are political some are societal um, but most are decrees of the world of the flesh and of the devil and our enemy is constantly tempting us as God's people to sin uh, and he's out there decreeing that sin is not dangerous uh, but we know that it is the enemy will try to discourage you and I uh, by decreeing doubt about the goodness of God and the love of God. But we've got to stand in our faith just as these uh, brave men of the Bible did uh, and push back against the decrees of darkness. Push back against these agendas and these decrees that are being released all across our land. Push back yeah. through prayer. Push back through praise and worship. Push back through witnessing and letting the word of God and who God is and what he does be released into the atmosphere. Uh, and those are ways that just like Mordecai drafted his letter, we can draft uh, truth and faith and, and get it out there. So these letters were written in the language of various people all throughout the Persian Empire, including Hebrew, uh, and they were distributed by the couriers of the king uh, using swift horses that belonged to the king. And these letters empowered the Jews to defend themselves from attack, and it gave them authority of the king to do it. So they were allowed to defend themselves. That's a big, a big key. Um, Mordecai's letter mirrored the evil edict of Haman, uh, serving as a counter edict. 
So it was basically gonna, gonna cancel it out. Haman's order empowered the people of the empire to quote, destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women from the New King James, Esther 3, 12 through 13. Well, Mordecai's letter on the flip side empowered them to defend their lives and destroy, kill, and annihilate any enemy that attacked them. We would look at it and say, well, yeah, you have that right to defend yourself. Well, people didn't always have the right to defend themselves. So God stepped in, giving the Jews this opportunity. God turned the decree of the enemy on its head, and he enabled his people to survive. Now, it's very likely that this decree probably stopped many attacks from taking place uh, in the first place altogether. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there were attacks, uh, many that happened, um, and God's people now had the authority uh, to take the battle to their adversaries and defend themselves. So when these letters of Mordecai reached the Jewish people, we read about it in our second section of verses. Um, it was welcomed with joy. It was welcomed with gladness. There was feasting. Uh, there was great celebration among the Jews and the people of the land, as there should be. You know, God stepped in for them. Hey, this is our, this is our way of deliverance. This is our way of escape. Praise God. Uh, and they celebrated accordingly. It's interesting to, to understand that when Haman's decree came out in Esther 3 and 15, uh, it resulted in confusion. Not joy, not gladness, not, not celebration, uh, but confusion. As people likely wondered, what is this strange proclamation? Um, you know, there's no way to keep peace in a vast empire by going in and killing and destroying certain people in that empire. That's not going to bring good. That's going to bring confusion. Uh, that's going to bring uh, difficulty. Uh, and so not a, not a good thing. It, it, would, it, it, would, it would not be, not be good for a nation. The edicts of the enemy always lead to confusion. That's how Satan tries to work and operate. His directives uh, set out to please the flesh, to doubt God, and to harm others. Confusion, chaos, and consternation are the result. And you can look around and see a lot of the edicts and decrees going out in our society are doing just that, causing constant consternation, chaos, harm, not benefiting humanity overall, but God's words, God's commands are altogether lovely and sweet. Psalm 119 and 103 says this, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That's what God's decrees, what God's commands and what God's ways will bring. God's commands pull the best from people and they bring life out of death, they bring joy, gladness when God's word is rightly divided and effectively declared. So we can have joy knowing that the Lord uh, will defend us. And we look back as we study a, a story like this, and we, many of us have not heard this for the first time. Uh, so we look back, we're like, yeah, this is how God does it. We, we've experienced this for ourselves. Um, and and so we, we know that's how God works. We know his words and his ways are always better. Um, but it, it's good to, to revisit these things because it builds our faith and it gives us what we need to continue to go forward. Uh, we as disciples, we can be encouraged uh, and we have cause to celebrate just like they did upon receiving Mordecai's letters because we know that God will defend us. God's our shield. God's our defense. Um, and he always protects us and keeps us. And so... So we've looked at how, how Esther stood one final time, asking the highest thing she could ask of the king. Uh, we've examined a little bit Mordecai's uh, letters uh, and, and what they were and, and some important aspects about it. But now we're going to finish up uh, this, this third and final topic, uh, and that is Mordecai's promotion. Uh, and that's kind of the, the focus of this lesson, remember, is that God will elevate, God will lift us up, into a place of effectiveness when we stand for his righteousness. And, and we see that over and over again. Uh, and so let's look at it. Let, let's finish it up here with, with Mordecai's promotion. Um, in many ways, out of this entire story of Esther, uh, in some ways, Mordecai um, is just as much a hero 
in the story as Esther is. Uh, just a, a, a recap, you know that, that Mordecai, of course, was a faithful servant to the king. And you remember back in Esther 2, he, he caught word of an assassination attempt against the king, um, and he, he, he made it known to the king. The king's life was spared. Uh, and so there, there's that about Mordecai. Uh, we know that in addition to being faithful to the king, he was faithful to God when he refused to bow to Haman in Esther chapter 3. And that's what really kicked off this whole entire series of events. So it all started uh, with Mordecai. And, and that to me was interesting didn't start with Esther, it started with Mordecai, uh, and he's just a man who stood, stood in faith. Um, so Mordecai led the way, and he allowed God to use him to bring about deliverance for his people. Now Mordecai was elevated after his faithfulness to God uh, and his sensitivity to working on behalf of God's people was present. It's possible that Mordecai's elevation began in Esther chapter 4, uh, when he learned of Haman's evil decree uh, and he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth and he began to fast for God to intervene. Uh, that was a, a practice of the time. They would put on, uh, as the King James calls it, sackcloth and ashes. And that was their way of, uh, of approaching God because of a, uh, a sorrowful or a negative thing that happened. So, so Mordecai here was, was seeking God for intervention. Uh, way back at the beginning. Um, and to the natural eye, what Mordecai did uh, didn't look in any way like elevation, but that could be the very moment when God began to elevate Mordecai. When he went before the king of kings and the lord of lords, a king that was much more powerful than the king of Persia, um, to try to intervene for for this, this bad situation. Um, Mordecai could have begun building a revolt uh, in the provinces and, and in the country, but the success of a military revolt would not have been very likely. Instead, what did he do? He sought God, and, and he discovered, and the story unfolds, that, that God had a plan all along. You don't know from what point God begins to elevate you, but when you're just faithful in the day in and the day out, God can do what he wants to do. You know, Mordecai's elevation kind of mirrors that of Joseph uh, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, who was another Hebrew in a foreign land, right? Joseph was wrongly accused. Joseph suffered uh, before God, but God elevated him in Egypt. And Joseph was placed in a position of influence to bring about the salvation of God's people. And, and that's why God elevates us, not for our own benefit, but he will elevate us to a place that will impact his people, namely almost always to bring about God's people to salvation. So in a similar way to Joseph, Mordecai was elevated at just the right time to issue a new decree so God's people could defend themselves. The timing of Esther and Mordecai's elevation had to be the right or the appointed time uh, or else the destruction of the Jews would have come with no ability for them to defend themselves. Here we learn and we understand and we see that God always knows the times and the seasons and he'll provide the help at the right time if we are faithful and we are true. God brings elevation um, and exaltation to humans uh, for certain times in history. Um, Psalm 75, 6 and 7 says, For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. We know that's, that's God's doing. He raises up kings, he brings down kings. He raises up humans for deliverance, he brings down humans. It's just the way that he does it. He elevated Joseph, he elevated Daniel, he elevated Esther, and he elevated Mordecai, all of whom lived in a country that was not their own. Hello, doesn't that sound so familiar? We're, we haven't been taken captive We've stayed put, but it feels like our country has slipped out from under us, and, and we feel like we are strangers in a foreign land. Yet God's purpose, if it was revealed and it was fulfilled in them, it will be revealed and fulfilled in us as we stand in our faith. 
God never brings in scripture um, exaltation for the purpose of human uh, aggrandizement or human benefit. Um, God never elevates us for human glory, but he does it for his glory. And I mentioned it, but it's important for us to understand the most common reason for God exalting a person is the salvation of others. When I read that, I thought, yeah, that really is true. God will exalt us into a, into a place that he might use us to influence and to save others. And, and we see that through each of these examples. Joseph, Daniel, Esther, Mordecai. God elevates people to perform his will almost always so that others can be saved. So we'll wrap it up with this. God still elevates to influence whom he chooses. Some people are chosen for places of influence in government, and that's necessary. Some people are chosen for places of influence in leading churches, and that's necessary. Some people are chosen for places of influence to be leaders in different organizations, and that is necessary. And I'll even insert here that people are, are chosen to be leaders in their homes. You may not influence a nation of thousands and thousands of people, but if you influence the three little ones in your household, you've influenced a nation. You've influenced the next generation. God brings us into places of, of exaltation as leaders in order that we might influence others for him. And, and, and don't ever feel like your level of leadership is not enough or your level of influence is not enough. I don't know that Joseph, Daniel, Esther, Mordecai knew exactly how big and how wide their influence would reach. They were just doing what they needed to do in the moment. Same is true for us. We don't know how far that our influence is going to reach, but if it's for God and his glory, then lead and influence uh, and, and fill the role that God has for you. Again, most important reason for elevation is so that another person can be saved. Many will never lead or be elevated to a place of national influence, but all of God's people, every one of us in this room, um, can be elevated by God to speak to someone about the saving name of Jesus and to testify about God's good work in our own lives to influence other people. And this elevation from God fulfills his purpose. It does, and it brings about what he wants to happen. Um, it turns sinners to him so they can experience forgiveness, can be baptized in his name, and filled with the Holy Ghost. So let's all pray and work and stand in faith uh, for God to be able to elevate us into a position of influence for the lives of those who are around us so they can experience this gospel and so all the glory can be given to God that he can be honored, just like these people that we've been studying, uh, Daniel and Esther and Mordecai. Uh, their <laughs> lives were a testimony to others, uh, and God will use our lives to do the very same thing if we will continue to stand in faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's stand together and let's just ask the Lord to, uh, to continue to use our lives to, to exalt us in the right place and the right time for his glory. Father, we are grateful for the example of your word. We thank you that you're the same as you've always been. And God, as we, your people, will stand in faith and stand for what is right, just like these Bible heroes that we've been studying. God, we know that you will take our lives and you will take that faith and use it to influence others. Lord, that's our desire today. We don't desire our own human glory, but we just want to stand for what's right, that you can use it, God, that others might be saved, that others might know you, that others might see you in the same way that we've been able to. So that's our heart's cry today, and we ask you, Lord, to use us for your glory. Help us to stand, God, that it might bring about your good purpose through our lives. We ask it together in Jesus' name. Amen.